So my name is Savi Sala. I'm the Chief of Body Imaging Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and uh, I'll be uh, doing the first part of this session, pitfalls in MRI of the, of the pelvis. So you're all ready with your devices because it's all interactive. So uh, what we want to accomplish in the next 40 minutes or so is discuss pitfalls related to physiological conditions that can mimic pathology in the pelvis, choice of imaging plane that is important to avoid certain pitfalls uh, in MRI of the pelvis, certain pitfalls related to staging of tumors of the cervix, endometrium and bladder. I'm going to show you examples of unusual sites and complications of classic lesions which could lead to pitfalls in image interpretation and hence diagnosis. I'm also going to show you a case or two of significant incidental findings uh, when you review uh, an exam for a completely different reason. So let's start with case one. All, all of you have your uh, smartphones or devices ready? Okay, here we are. Sagittal MRI of the pelvis on a female patient. Okay, there you got another image. And here's the question. You still have the two images to look at as you, um, as you try to answer the question. What is the most likely diagnosis? Is it one, adenomyosis, two, lyomyoma, or three, myometrial contraction? Okay, can we have the results of the voting? Okay, those are the questions, and you have the two images there. Okay, the votes are coming, so that's good. Okay, so here we are. So it's almost like most, most of you got it right. It's actually myometric contraction. It's a few uh, saying that it might be adenomyosis. And that's a real pitfall. Uh, and only a very few uh, saying lyomyomas. Now, if you only had one image and didn't have the other image, all three were going to be valid. So it could have been an um, intramural lyomyoma with some mass effect into the endometrial cavity. It could have been adenomyosis very well. However, given the fact that the, the uterus looks absolutely normal, uh, within 10 minutes after the first sequence, and it's transient in nature, that leads to the correct diagnosis of myometrial contraction. Again, it's transient. That's the first pearl. And the second pearl is usually it can take up to, usually it's about 10 minutes to resolve, and the, it may move along the myometrium as the uh, contractions sort of um, circulate through the myometrium. However, it can take up to 45 minutes to resolve. Do you need to repeat the sagittal? Sometimes not, because you have other sequences, other planes to look at, and it has to be at least in two planes present in order to call it a uh, a pathology. So those are transient, uh, just remember, and do not uh, confuse them with adenomyosis because that's the, uh, the major confuser. Okay, case number two. This patient MRI done for, for uh, lumbar spine pain. So that was the uh, sagittal, uh, sagittal image. What is the most likely diagnosis? So no, no symptoms whatsoever, incidental finding. Adenomyosis. Is this a uterine sarcoma, or is this a patient on oral contraceptive use? Okay. So sagittal t weighted images. Okay, so we have a few more. Again, adenomyosis, uterine sarcoma, or oral contraceptive use. So we are excellent. So the majority got it correct. It is actually oral contraceptive use. Um, these are typical appearances with a, sw a swollen and globular myometrium. The endometrium is very atrophic. The myometrium becomes of high signal intensity on titrated images. 
This is not to be confused with adenomyosis when you have thickening of the inner myometrium only. Here, the whole myometrium is swollen and globular. And high signal intensity on titrated images. The adenomyosis is low signal intensity on titrated images, but it does have punctate areas or cystic areas of high signal intensity. And again, endometrium becomes atrophic. Uh, in case of uterine sarcoma, you have a complete disorganization of the, of the whole um, uh, architecture of the uterus with the tumor um, invading, and, and you can lose the, you, you, you completely lose the endometrium myometer interface. So it looks ugly, uh, uterine sarcomas. Okay. Now we move to the um, plane of imaging. We have a 30-year-old patient who presents with recurrent miscarriages. Okay. So what is the diagnosis? Is it a unicornate uterus? Is it a bicornate uterus? Is it a septate uterus? Or is it a uterus didelphus? Okay, unicornate uterus, bicornate, septate, or didelphus. Excellent. Okay, again, it's retroverted uterus, which makes it a little bit more tricky. So the ovaries here, and there's the uterus. Is it unicornate, bicornate, septate, or didelphus? I think now we can have the results, please. Okay, perfect. So uh, the majority got it right. It's a septate uterus. It's not a unicornate uterus because there's not just one corner. You have two cavities here. So um, it's not a bicornate because there's not enough separation between the corner. There is a septum. And some thought it was uterus didelphus, and there probably is not enough information here to actually make the diagnosis. However, what do you think? Do you actually have enough information on these images to adequately plan intervention? So the question is slightly different. You got the diagnosis correct, you thought it was a septic uterus. However, is there enough information on these images to adequately plan intervention? So pretty simple, yes, no, or not sure. But maybe avoid not sure. Again, the surgeon will need to plan the intervention on this young patient, so... Okay, if we can have the results, please. Excellent. So there is not enough information here to plan intervention. Again, the plane of, of imaging here was not correct. It was just a straight axial. So that was uh, the first image I showed you, done with a straight axial. You don't see the exact length of the septum, but once we actually do a true coronal to the uterine cavity, you want to see this nice delineation of the, uter of the uh, septum. Because as we know, you have to measure the length of the septum, the muscular part, and the fibrous part exactly, and give all this information to the, um, to the surgeon who will plan the intervention. Perfect. So let's move on to the next case. We have a 69-year-old female patient. She presents with vaginal bleeding. Ultrasound is performed elsewhere and shows a large cervical mass. Biopsy shows adenocarcinoma of the cervix, and the MRI is performed for staging prior to planning the treatment. Okay, so simple question. Is there right parametrial invasion? Yes, no, or you cannot assess and you need another plane. Again, this is a, a, a uterus. The, the cervical, the cervix is expanded by this huge mass of intermediate signal intensity with areas of necrosis. So uterine corpus, uterine cervix, and the vagina here. Again, the uterine corpus here and this big mass. So is there any right parametrial invasion? Cervical stroma here on the left, and that's the right side. Yes, no, or you cannot assess, and you need another plane to assess it properly. Why it is important? It's very important because if there is parametric invasion, obviously the patient will go to chemoradiotherapy, 
Well, if there is no parameter invasion, the tumor is big, and in some institutions, they still might have to go to chemoradiotherapy, but in some institutions, they will still go to surgery. It's totally dependent on institution and even surgeon. Okay, there we go. So uh, the majority said yes, they have enough information. Probably they thought it was the right parametrial invasion. So did I when I just reviewed this sequence, this uh, imaging plane. Um, some of them, just only a small percentage said there's no parametrial invasion. And then it's a fair amount saying um, can't assess. So the correct answer is can't assess in another plane. This was a straight axial plane, and I just want to illustrate how important it is to get a true axial to the cervix or to the tumor. So this is our case, a large tumor, distorted uterus. This is the axial that I showed you, and I would agree with you on those images. If you provide only those images, you'll say there is parametrial invasion. Our surgeon wasn't happy. He said it was a mobile cervix. I can't even feel any parametrial invasion. We said, oh, it's gross parametrial invasion. However, there is another plane, which is completely perpendicular to the tumor, how it should be when you try to stage a cervical cancer, especially for parametrial invasion. And as you can see, this is a cervical stroma, completely intact. So the tumor is expanding the cervix, but not actually invading beyond the stroma into the parametrium. Very, very important to get the correct imaging plane, especially with the large tumors when you stage cervical cancers. They have to be perpendicular to the tumor or to the cervix, so it's slightly oblique axial rather than a true axial to the pelvis. Just to illustrate again, this is another case with a large cervical tumor. You can see the tumor is quite bulky. It extends the lower uterine segment, the sagittal. This is the oblique plane, so axial oblique. And you can uh, very easily see parametrial invasion bilaterally in this case, so the tumor, flank tumor into both parametrium, encasing the periuterine vessels. One can do a coronal plane. Um, a, a few years ago, um, it was a, quite a nice paper on the literature actually showing that there is no difference uh, in what plane you image. However, I would suggest that you use the oblique plane. It's easier. And you can see also here parametrial invasion. Also, you can see lymphadenopathy. But you wouldn't miss this lymphadenopathy if you scroll up and down the axial images too. So uh, the correct plane is very important when you try to stage cervical cancer, especially the large cervical cancers. Okay, let's move to the next case. We have a 51-year-old female patient. She presents with postmenopausal bleeding. Ultrasound shows a polypoid mass. Now, I'm going to stress what the biopsy showed. The biopsy showed a grade 1 endometrioid adenocarcinoma arising from a polyp. Okay, so fairly low-grade tumor arising from a polyp. Good prognosis generally and not much extent of disease. MRI was performed for staging. Okay, so this is the sagittal. It shows this large uh, polyp, uh, which is protruding into the cervix. And there is something here in the pouch of Douglas. Again, I'm just going to go back to show you the lesion in the pouch of Douglas or a cul-de-sac. That's the oblique. In the level of the cervix, so obliques in the endometrial cancer are taken perpendicular to the, obviously, the endometrium or to the tumor. So this is, as you come down further, just to show you the adnexal mass. This corresponds to the right ovary. Okay, after contrast, diffusion-weighted images with a B-value of 800. All those images are matched for location. And then the ADC map and also the fused images. I'm going to flick to the ADC map and the fused images. Okay, so grade one endometrioid carcinoma of the endometrium, and now we've got this mass in the right adnexa. The right ovary is not seen separately. Okay, so what is the diagnosis? Do we have endometrial cancer, which we know we do, right, from pathology, metastasis to the right ovary, synchronous endometrial and ovarian cancer, or endometrial cancer and indeterminate ovarian lesion. So, metastasis through the ovary from the known cancer, synchronous tumors, both an endometrial and ovarian cancer, or an endometrial cancer and indeterminate ovarian lesion. They could all be right, the choices, by the way, so. Okay. Okay.
Okay, so we can have the results, please. Okay, perfect. So the majority got it right. Endometrial cancer indeterminate ovarian lesion. However, and this case was a hypercellular ovarian fibroma in, indeed. I'm going to go back because I want to show you those images. It's important because on the first read, uh, this is a real case. Um, I thought it was either metastasis to the ovary or our synchronous primary. Why? It looks really ugly on those images. Intermediate T2 signal intensity with some cystic areas, so mixed cystic and solid. It enhances after contrast. Restricted diffusion, very bright on, on diffusion-weighted images. You saw it was restricted on the ADC maps. So this slide looks malignant. However, the patient had a grade one endometrioid carcinoma arising from a polyp, which is very unlikely to spread to the ovary. Now, are those typical appearances to the... Are those typical appearances to the um, ovarian fibroma? Of course not. They're not typical appearances. This was a hypercellular fibroma which had actually undergone torsion. And the point is just to, to point to a pitfall. The fibromas don't always look, um, you know, dark, low sickle intensity. I've got a later example to show to you. Especially if they undergo torsion, they lose the classic uh, very low T2 signal intensity. But also look at the clinical history and keep it in mind when you report a case it would be almost impossible for a grade one endometrial carcinoma confined to a polyp to actually give metastasis to the ovary. A synchronous tumor could have been possible too. Let's move to case number six. 85-year-old female patient presents with uh, vaginal bleeding. Clinical examination found a large cervical mass. Biopsy shows a squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. MRI is performed for staging. Okay, the question here is very simple. Is there any bladder wall invasion? With bladder wall, I mean mucosal invasion, because that will be stage 4A under FIGO. Yes, no, or not sure. Just again to remind you, stage 4A, it's mucosal invasion, because FIGO is a clinical um, staging system. It's not a surgical one like endometrium. Um, so it's based on cystoscopy. So a large tumor, the patient has a pessary in situ. The tumor invades the lower uterine segment. Is this bladder mucosal invasion, yes or no? Or not sure? Okay, we'll leave a few more seconds because there's more attendance in the room, so... Again, a T2 sagittal image with a large cervical mass with some abnormality of the bladder wall here. Is this mucosal invasion? Yes, no, or not sure. Okay, I think we can have the votes now. Results? Okay. So it's kind of yes, some, no, some, the others, and majority not sure. This is a difficult case, and then it's actually a pitfall uh, which... Uh, it's quite common. So the answer is no. There is no mucosal invasion. And let me just go through, uh, through that. The, our case is the case in the middle here, the same image. What you have here is the bullous uh, edema of the, of, the bladder, of the mucosa of the bladder. So basically the tumor is invading the serosa and the muscularis propria, and the mucosa is lifted away. Whenever you see this intact mucosa lifted away, this is not invasion. It's telling you there is no mucosal invasion. On the other hand, there's a large cervical tumor, a different case, and you can see how the mucosa is completely gone. The, the, blood, the tumor is invaded and eaten out the whole of the posterior wall of the urinary bladder. That's another case of the bullous edema of the, of the mucosa of the bladder. That's a mixed mullerian tumor or a carcinosarcoma with a new classification. This is a uterine rather than cervical tumor. The same principle. It's invaded the serosa and the muscularis propria, but the mucosa is lifted away. So you can see how if you do an endoscopy, you'll just see an inflamed mucosa, but the mucosa is intact. So this is not a stage 2B, our case, because it's a large tumor. It invaded both parametria. I didn't show you the images of that, but the, the bladder mucosa was intact. Okay, case 7. 32-year-old female patients presented with abdominal discomfort and, mac and macroscopic hematuria. 
so visible hematuria. Ultrasounds performed elsewhere and showed a bladder lesion. Biopsy was inconclusive, but suggestive of a spindle cell sarcoma. MRI was performed for further evaluation prior to possible cystectomy. 32-year-old, so bladder cancer, quite unusual. Okay, so there are a few images I want to show. So sagittal, that's the uterus here, the uh, corpus, the cervix, the bladder, the lesion in question here. And again, this is a coronal, the uterus here, the lesion. Again, that's a nice example of the edema of the, of the mucosa, which is lifted away. That's an axial, and you can see again the lesion here. T1-weighted images. And with fat suppression, just to demonstrate those punctate small areas of high sequel intensity with fat suppression, so that you can barely see them uh, without fat suppression, but after fat suppression, you can see them very well. So I'm going to leave the two uh, main images while you think about the possible diagnosis, what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it a bladder sarcoma, as the pathologist was hedging the bets about it? Is it severe endometriosis? Is it a lymphoma? They do arise from, uh, in that site, so... Or is it a cervical cancer? Just to point out again, this is the cervix here, the lesion. And again, this is the low uterine segment coming to the cervix, so that's the lesion here. So we've got four choices. The pathologist is right, although they're not sure. It's a bladder sarcoma. Patient is 32-year-old. Is it endometriosis? Is it a lymphoma? Or cervical cancer? Okay, I think we can have the results. Perfect. Okay, so um, majority got it right. It is actually endometriosis, severe endometriosis uh, in this patient. Uh, let me just go back to the image and I'll show you another similar case. So here we are. So the key here is that this is a case of an endometriotic implant with, low, with these areas of high sickle intensity, is invading the uh, anterior aspect of the uterus, so subserosal uterine endometriosis, also invading uh, the bladder wall, lifting the mucosa away. Obviously, there is hematuria because there is irritation of the mucosa. You can see the endometriosis sort of invading the full thickness, but sparing the mucosa here of the bladder. And this patient does not need a, a cystoscopy. The pathology was reviewed. And indeed, sometimes severe endometriosis can elicit a very exuberant uh, proliferation of the fibroblasts and spindle cells that can be confused with the, uh, with the sarcoma. That's another case similar to the case I showed you, but now instead of being anteriorly uh, in between the bladder and the cervix, so it's posteriorly. It's tethering the sigmoid colon. You can see these areas of high sickle intensity within the, uh, within the lesion, which is invading the posterior aspect of the, of the uterus, so subserosal uterine uh, endometriosis tethering um, the tissue planes. This is a more classic appearance that you probably are used, uh, used to see with a plaque in the pouch of Douglas obliterating the cul de sac uh, along the um, sigmoid colon. Um, just think of all those barium enemas we did years ago to actually detect those uh, irregularities and picket fencing in, from endometriosis. So when it comes to endometriosis in general, if you see endometriomas, they're usually bilateral rather than unilateral. Uh, there will be high sickle intensity of ovarian masses, which remain high after fat suppression. You saw how those little areas of uh, high sickle intensity dots within the lesion, uh, they remained high sickle intensity, so there are uh, areas of, of small, uh, small areas of blood products. They have a range of low sickle intensity on titrated images. The implants are a little trickier. They can be uh, like this which are when they're active, so it's a lot of areas of bleeding inside, or they can be very dark with tethering of the tissue planes and obliteration. Uh, if you have enhancing components uh, within both, then uh, there is a high chance of uh, having a malignancy. So this is just to um, give you a, an example how endometriosis can look um, 
completely bizarre and very aggressive. Now, in questioning the patient back, the patient had cyclical hematuria, which should have been a clue to the clinician uh, to the diagnosis of endometriosis. Moving to case number eight. We have a 48-year-old female patient's patient which presents with right iliac fossa pain. Ultrasound shows an indeterminate right at nexal mass, and the MRI is performed for further characterization, as we do in practice. Okay, so we have sagittal titrated images. Uh, the uterus here, this is the mass in question, sort of mainly cystic with some solid components of very low T2 signal intensity. Um, and again, here on the axial, you can see multiple cystic components. I hope you can appreciate kind of the, uh, there is different signal intensity even between the cystic components and the very low signal intensity solid component. After contrast, there is some enhancement of the solid component. You can see here uh, before contrast, fat sat images, T1 fat saturation images, and you can see after contrast there is definite enhancement. So I'm going to leave for you the uh, the most important image, again, multiloculated cystic mass of slightly different signal intensity on the cystic components with a very dark, very dark t 2 solid component, almost as dark or even darker than the adjacent skeletal muscle. This is just the, um, the bowel, so don't get confused about this lesion here. So what do we have? We have a mucinous cyst adenoma, a serous cyst adenoma, a cyst adenofibroma, or ovarian cancer. Now the CA125 is very slightly elevated. Again, mucinous cyst adenoma, serous cyst adenoma, cyst adenofibroma, or ovarian cancer. Okay, I think we can have the votes, the results. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the correct answer, that's a mistake, of the, it's cyst adenofibroma. So actually the majority got it right. Um, it's actually a mucinous cyst adenofibroma. So cyst adenofibromas can be mucinous or, it can be, uh, or they can be serous. Um, what is very, very specific, and I try to give you a clue by emphasizing it, is the low, very low signal intensity solid component teacher weighted images. That's very specific of cystadenofibromas. By having those locules of different signal intensity, it tells you that it's probably mucinous rather than serous, but that doesn't matter very much. Those are benign lesions. This, you know, that is purely academic. So cystadenofibromas are usually unilateral cystic masses. The most likely subtype of serous tumor who mimics malignant lesion due to presence of an enhancing solid component. So don't get fooled by the enhancing solid components. Always go back to the titrated images and look at how dark the solid component is, really low signal intensity. It's fairly specific, so that's what I want to emphasize as a pearl. Sometimes they have what is called a black sponge appearance in this case, it's bilateral. You can see the cystic component and the solid components, again, very dark, darker than the skeletal muscle. It's important because those are completely benign lesions. And in this second case here, this was a patient which was considered for transplant, for liver transplant. And the extent of surgery, obviously, they, they, uh, you don't have to remove them. But, you know, before a surgery like that, like a transplantation, they wanted to be absolutely sure. So it was a simple laparoscopic remover of the masses. And it was indeed cyst adenofibroma, again, in the second case. So, again, I just want to draw your attention to the very solid, very low signal intensity solid component on titrated images. They will enhance, but they're very low signal intensity. Okay, going to case number nine. This is a patient with acute right ILAC fossa pain. I know we're, I'm supposed to show you MRI. I will in a minute. Indeterminate mass on ultrasound. I don't know if you'd agree with me or not, but this is pretty indeterminate on ultrasound. And the MRI is performed for further characterization. The patient has this chronic on and off pain uh, on the right. So what do we have here? We have a large mass. I'm pointing out to the ovary 
on the right here, the left ovary is normal. You can see the left ovary. Sorry, you cannot see the, the left ovary, so that's the right ovary, normal, and you cannot see the left ovary separately. Okay, the most significant images are large mass. That's the ovary on the right, so sort of the same side. And the left ovary is not seen separately. Intermittent pain. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it a subserosal lyomyoma? Is it ovarian cancer? Is it a right ovarian fibroma? Or is it a left ovarian fibroma which has undergone torsion? Again, the right ovary here is completely normal. We don't see the left, and this is a large mass. In a patient with intermittent pain, pelvic pain. So do we have a subserosal lyomyoma, ovarian cancer, a right ovarian fibroma, or a left one which has undergone torsion? So it's flipped on the other side and undergone torsion. Okay, we have a few votes coming up. Okay, excellent. So it is indeed a left ovarian fibroma undergone torsion. I think this is good. You pay attention to the fact that the, uh, this is the case again back, that the patient had a normal right ovary, so this cannot be arising from the, from the right ovary. We cannot see the left ovary. There was no connection to the uterus that I showed you on the images. The patient had pain. So what we see here is this is the pedicle with the vessels torted, the twisting of the, of the left side fibroma, which is twisted on the other side. So that's the pedicle sign on ultrasound. On uh, MRI, it actually can be seen much better on the ultrasound. You can also see the flow on ultrasound. Um, now, this is um, important. It conf was confirmed that surgery was causing the patient pain, and probably it was torting and detorting as they do most of the time. Uh, it's a real pitfall because what we always believe is that the ovarian fibromas classically would look like this one here, really dark, T1 weighted, um, on, T on T2 weighted and T1 weighted images, uh, darker than a skeletal muscle. You can see this little um, uh, edge here, the big side arising from the uh, left ovary. This is another example of the torsion of the, uh, of the left ovarian fibroma. In this case, it hasn't flipped other. On the other side, it's smaller. Uh, and you can see it's still of high signal intensity. So they don't have to be of low signal intensity all the time. And again, edema due to torsion. And this is our case. And in this case, you can see the pedicle as well. Okay, let's go to uh, case number 10. 35-year-old female patient with known endometriosis presents with acute right iliac fossa pain and fever. That's important to note. Clinical history is always important when you read uh, your exams, being that MR, CT, or anything else. So acute right iliac fossa pain and fever. MRI performed for evaluation of progressive endometriosis. Again, known endometriosis, known endometrioma, but now we have new symptoms. Okay, so here we are. This was the first MRI performed, and this is the MRI, the current one, when she had symptoms. So T1-weighted images, she does have an endometrioma after fat saturation remains bright. So we definitely have an endometrioma here. She presents again with pain and fever. And this is the lesion again, T1, T1 with fat saturation and after giving contrast. So what is the diagnosis on this second MRI? Is it endometrioma? Just simple endometrioma, or do we have an abscess now? Just very simple choice. Either A or B, or one or two. Again, this is the first exam, a few months before the current exam. The lesion is exactly the same, almost the same in size, but the appearances have changed. Okay, I think we can have the results now. Excellent. Well, technically speaking, there is still an endometrioma, so perhaps we'll give some points to, to the audience who chose one. But the important is to recognize that this is a complication of endometrioma, 
now there is an abscess developing in the endometrioma. So uh, this was classic appearances a few months before the current MRI. Bright on T1, remains bright, even brighter after fat saturation. The same lesion is not as bright, it's not bright on T1 anymore, it's intermediate. After fat saturation, remains of the same sickle intensity, and you can see this intense rim enhancement after contrast, which is typical for an abscess anywhere. So this is an abscess developing on an endometrioma. And again, a lot of pus was drained on ultrasound. Just, this is to point out the compli unusual complications of the common lesions. So because she had an endometrioma before, just look at the image carefully because it might be a complication of what she had uh, in the past. So um, don't just go by the previous report, no change. Okay, case 11, we have a 65-year-old female patient that presents with hematuria. Pelvic ultrasound shows a bladder lesion, biopsy shows an inflammatory pseudotumor. MRI was performed for evaluation. Okay, there we are. So we have sagittal tissue weighted image and coronal. That's the bladder here with the lesion in question. Axial, uterus, the lesion. The axial again, those are diffusion weighted images. Post contrast and the ADC maps. Okay, so I'm going to leave the most important images here, the coronal, the bladder lesion, and the axial diffusion weighted images. What is the most likely diagnosis? Is it a bladder cancer? Is it an inflammatory pseudotumor? Is it a bladder lymphoma? Or is it a cervical cancer? See if I can re remind you, the enhancement was very intense, pretty homogeneous, very restricted diffusion. You can see lymphadenopathy as well. The cervix looked relatively normal on the sagittal. Okay, if we can have the results, please. Okay, so um, yes, because the biopsy said infl inflammatory pseudotumor, however, the correct diagnosis is a bladder lymphoma. And I'm going to leave this slide for a moment. Um, the fact that it's very homogeneous enhancement and very restricted diffusion, um, this usually lymphoma does that, so uh, the, the, the cells are really tightly packed. They have much more restricted diffusion than carcinomas. Uh, and also, as you can see, this is growing more outside than inside the bladder, which is quite typical for lymphoma. If it was just a, a transition cell carcinoma, it would have had a different pattern, growing more inside, and then, of course, you can spread outside. Uh, but this is mostly centered in the space between the bladder uh, and the adjacent tissue. That's another case of the bladder, primary bladder lymphoma. Again, you can see here it's more centered in the lymphatic tissues uh, adjacent to the bladder rather than bladder wall itself. The primary lymphoma of the bladder is very rare. It usually arises from the lymphoid tissue deep to the uterine fold, so usually be on the posterior position here, but uh, those are unusual location I'm showing to you because it's a session on the pitfalls. Cystoscopy can be completely normal, not in our case, obviously. Usually it's homogeneous mass with avid enhancement. Lymphadenopathy is not dominant, so this case didn't have it, but the case I showed you uh, did have lymphadenopathy. Um, however, just uh, remember that they homogeneously enhance and they have very, very restricted diffusion on diffusion-weighted images. Um, I think I'm going to skip this case because we started slightly late. And I'm just going to um, show you this one. 44-year-old female patient presents with um, heavy menstruation. Ultrasound shows an enlarged uterus. MRI is performed for further evaluation. Okay, so there we are, the sagittal here. The patient's got a tampon in the vagina, so uh, not to get confused. This is a parasagittal, just to show the rest and kind of point out another area here. And this is an axial, so the uterus is on the sagittal, but then there's something else going on. We're into significant incidental find it, findings. So what is the most significant diagnosis in this patient? Is it adenomyosis, is it a uterine sarcoma, or is it a sigmoid cancer? 
Again, you have the views of the uterus and then of the bowel. So it's the most significant. It may be two in the same time, but what is the most significant one? Okay, I think was it the vote? Can we have the results? Okay, they're coming. So adenomyosis, the most significant one, uterine sarcoma or sigmoid cancer. Okay, if we can have the results. <laughs> okay. The patient definitely does have adenomyosis, and that's for sure, and it's probably causing, or not probably, but for sure is causing her heavy menstruation. However, and I tried to give a clue by saying this is the, blood, the, the, the area of interest. Uh, she does have a sigmoid cancer, which is unknown of, and you can see this apple core lesion, you know, a sigmoid mass. Uh, she doesn't have a uterine sarcoma. This is not typical of uterine sarcoma at all. This is just severe adenomyosis involving the whole myometrium. So don't forget that sometimes the core of an image, like on that sagittal further up, it might be another significant abnormality, which is likely to you know, cause more trouble to the patient than, in this case, adenomyosis. But these are other cases um, of sigmoid cancer, again, bilateral ovarian masses, and you can see sigmoid cancer here. This was incidental coming for evaluation of a, of a pelvic mass. However, there is ascites, and you can see it's, um, a sigmoid tumor. And that operation was a mucinous um, sigmoid cancer. So in summary, I hope I've shared with you um, that one has to be aware of physiological conditions that can mimic pathology, are very important because then you're overcall pathology. The correct choice of imaging plane is crucial, especially when you try to evaluate uh, uterine anomalies as well as staging uh, uterine cancers, both endometrial and cervical cancer. Just be aware of the spurs and pitfalls that we, uh, we mentioned as I showed you the cases. You also have to be familiar with unusual sites and complications of classic lesions. That's very important, such as the case of the um, abscess arising from endometrioma. And also just be aware of significant incidental findings because those are the important ones when it comes to individual patients. Thank you very much for your attention.